Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the J by J Film Festival. My name is Shash Ganazi. I'm the senior community shaliach at the POSIS JCC of Northern Virginia. And I'm uh, very happy to be here with you today for a talk back uh, for the wonderful documentary Ma'abarot, uh, the Israeli transit camps. Um, feel free at any point of our conversation, the next 45 minutes or so, to put down your questions in the Q&A box so we can relate to them and answer those questions. Uh, I'm more than delighted to have with me today Arik Bernstein, who's a co-creator of Ma'abarot. Uh, Arik is a creator and producer and has been a leading force in the Israeli film industry for the past 20 years. He has initiated and overseen numerous documentaries, drama and documentary series, as well as a multitude of international co-productions. His films and programs have been screened in major film and TV festivals worldwide and have been awarded numerous Israeli and international prizes. In 1993, Arik established Matar Productions, later forming Alma Films in 2003. Welcome, Arik, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Where are you uh, talking to us uh, today from? Uh, night, early night time in Tel Aviv. Early night time in Tel Aviv. So thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Wonderful having you. And we're, as we said, going to talk about Ma'abarot, a wonderful documentary that reveals pieces of history um, that are meaningful for the history of Israel. Um, please, if you can kind of remind us and take us back to the documentary, the details of it and the time that we're talking about. Well, let's start with the time we're talking about. Um, I always like to talk about, most of my work is historical films and uh, TV series one way or the other. So I, I believe that context, historical context is not necessarily an excuse that you can't criticize and judge, but you definitely need to have the context in order to understand uh, the background of what's going on. So we're talking about 1948, uh, State of Israel, May 1948. Um, immediately a war breaks out, a very fierce war in terms of people killed the worst war ever in, in Israeli history, a very expensive war as wars usually are. And Israel is basically on the verge of um, bankruptcy, no money, no food or very little food. And immediately tens and thousands of immigrants, Jewish immigrants start pouring in basically. Um, within the first two years between 1948 and 1950, around 700,000 um, Jewish immigrants, or Lim Chadashim, came to Israel, um, which kind of overwhelmed the 600 or 650 Jews already living here. It's really a phenomenon in the world history of a country doubling its population in two years. That doesn't happen. And um, the, the, the first big waves coming in are from the DP camps in Germany uh, and Poland, mostly Germany. We're talking about mostly around 150,000 uh, Polish Jews, 150,000 Romanian Jews, Hungarian, who kind of survived the war one way or the other. Very soon after that, a large number of Yemenite Jews and then Iraqi Jews, and much later, the North African Jews. So that's kind of the situation where we're at in 1948, 1949, when something has to be done with all these hundreds and thousands of people coming in. Unlike the Lower East Side in the beginning of the 19th, 20th century where they just came and, you know, everyone kind of took care of themselves one way or the other. It's a different situation. Absolutely, without a doubt, you know, a new state, the first two years of the state, like you're telling us no money. Um, how how does the state deal with this amount of doubling its size of population, right, of Jewish population uh, with without money? What, what caused that? Uh, because we also know that, and we see it in the documentary itself, that the government brought a lot of the immigrants into Israel 
and encourage it in a way, um, reluctantly or, or in any other way, how do they deal with it uh, economically? Well, most of the money came in from, um, um, you know, for international, mostly American Jewish, um, you know, mostly American Jews, mostly. Uh, philanthropists, probably. Philanthropists, right. yeah. yeah, that's, I, I guess, I don't know exactly the numbers, but I would say at least 50 or 60 percent came in. Um, and some, uh, you know, foreign, uh, foreign, uh, you know, countries can gave money or, or assisted with in different ways. We, it's, it's, we're kind of jumping ahead that we have to remember that in 1952, the reparation agreement with Germany uh, materialized, which changed everything from, you know, very drastically. But we'll get to that later. Okay. But they deal with it. They didn't deal with it. They did, they did. People were hungry. People were living in terrible conditions, um, both in the camps and outside the camps. It's mostly in the camps. I mean, you saw the film. I mean, hardly running water, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's it's refugee camps. I mean, there's not any nicer way of putting it. It's basically refugee camps. Um, probably, I don't think there was really any other choice, but. Um, in very quickly, I would say around 1950, into about a year or a year and a half after these camps were fully, fully populated, you know, we start with the differences between the, um, you know, the the uh, between the Jews coming from Europe, Jews coming from the Islam countries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is a, a good, a very crucial part of our film and also a crucial part of what happened. Absolutely. And we're going to uh, discuss that a bit later, that, that main difference between the different populations within the camps. Um, so now, now that we've established you know, the background to the film, I want to ask you, one of the co-creators of, of the film, what brought you and your partners, if, and if you can tell us about them a little bit, what brought you to create Ma Barot, this time more than any other time, dealing with this topic. Well, Mabahot started like so many other projects that one day you get an idea or somebody brings you an idea. And this specifically was brought to me by uh, Hila Shalem Baharad. Um, as of last year, Dr. Hila Shalem Baharad, she finished a PhD on the Mabahot, which she's been working on for the last 10, 12 years, I mean, on, on this subject. And she came to me with the idea uh, we did some kind of seminars together because I had some home movies taken in the Mabarot. So we did, we had some kind of collaboration. Um, my first response to, to Hila was, it's a great idea, but I'm sure there have been dozens of films about the Mabarot. But once I looked into it, I found out that there was nothing. I mean, close to zero. This is a period which was discussed a little bit in the academic world, also not very much. Uh, a few books, I mean, fiction, very few, I mean, one short film, which was actually made by our director, Dina Zviriklis, who uh, is a completely different background from my own. She came from Baghdad, from Iraq. And as a baby, she was one or two years old, lived in the Mabarot for two or three years with her family. Um, and she made a short film in the eight, mid eighties, a short fiction film about the Mabarot. And there was a bits and pieces here and there in different kind of, you know, historical Israeli series, but a serious film or study, uh, cinematic study, uh, television study was never been done. So I said, well, that's, it's about time. Time is right. You know, it, it takes, it takes time to digest, you know, traumatic times in, you know, in a nation's, uh, some, some countries do it better, some countries do it. I think Israel kind of is now in a, well, not now, for the last 10 years, Israel is definitely in the in a state of mind to um, 
rethink about and rejudge and re reevaluate. Um, you know, as we talked a little bit before about the 1973 war or things that happened before that. So I think this is a good time to Israel. I, I, I think Israel actually, in, in that sense, I think Israel is kind of, I wouldn't say special, but um, I think if, if I look at other countries, America, I don't know how much, I mean, it took many years for Ken Burns to do Vietnam. How long? Four years it took him. I mean, not him, but um, uh, so th you know, country. It, it takes time for th for the kind of things to evolve into a sense where you can openly talk about subjects which are kind of hushed. So, from your words, I understand that that the fact that documents um, of this magnitude on the topic of Ma'abarot. This, this comes from the trauma in the history of Israel from these events and uh, the, whatever occurred in the transit camps. Am I correct? In many ways, in many, in many senses, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say definitely there was, for many years, there was supposedly a reason why the Ma'abarot wasn't discussed. I mean, it's not, you know, things don't happen just by chance. Um, and you know, as in many places, as in families, you're busy doing other things. So you know, why waste time on thinking about things which are 70 years ago? But uh, since, and you know, we'll get to that, I'm sure. Since the Ma'abot is still so much part of the Israeli DNA today, it seems very natural to deal with it in, in, in a serious and deep way. Absolutely, and we will definitely discuss that later on in our conversation. I just want to remind everyone who's joining us that please feel free to write questions for Arik uh, in the Q&A box so we can refer to those and direct the questions to Arik. Um, so I'm, I'm going back to, to the co-creation with Hila and with Dina and you. How do you approach uh, collecting the materials for the film? We can see in the film, we can see photographs and video clips and uh, and you, from from the production side of it, but also historically, and with the narrative you're bringing, how do you put it in a package that that makes sense and that is also relevant to whoever is watching it now these days, like us, that can make sense of uh, whatever happened there? Okay, well, I think actually the relevance part is kind of easy in many ways because the issues, the, the socio-economical issues which we bring up in Ma'abarot are very much part of Israeli society today. I guess in many, I, I presume maybe more for uh, you know, Israelis living here than, than American Jews in the States, but definitely that we knew we're touching a raw nerve or at least quite a few raw nerves, I would say. I mean, my sister who is a sociologist and a very well-known sociologist, she was actually one of the first people who wrote about the Ma'abarot in late 70s, which is, and so he, And when I went to her and I told her, you know, very excited that I'm doing a film about the Ma'abarot, her first reaction was, don't come to me for sympathy when everybody starts yelling at you, which is, which is the case because this is the kind of, this is the kind of topic that whatever you do, some people, or, or all the people will be angry. I mean, nobody will be very, totally satisfied. Why don't you mention this? And why did you mention that? And why did you mention this too much? And this not enough, et cetera, et cetera, which is good. I mean, I always, when I make a film, if if, if everybody's angry at me, I may, I did a good job. Um, that's kind of my-, my if, you, if you get the right reactions, you know that, that you did your job in, in creating them. Yeah. So, and, and then the second part, which, which is interesting, which you mentioned was, um, we had two very, very major problems. One was solved pretty easily because we hadn't the slightest idea if we find any footage. And to our surprise and amazement and, 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 and you know, very lucky, there's tons of material done about them. Mabarot was apparently, which you see it, was a very sexy subject. 
you know, we're talking about 1948. The whole world is going into transitions. People move from, you know, from Romania to Poland to Transylvania. I mean, the whole world is a movement and the Jewish people as well. And it's, it's three years, only three years after the Holocaust. So this is a very, you know, it's a very photogenic and it, it, it kind of pulls not only, you know, the usual uh, people who make films, but, you know, uh, top-notch photographers, uh, you know, filmmakers um, from all over the world. So there was, there's tons of footage of it, which is, was surprising. The, the difficult part was who do we talk to? Because most of the people who came in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, were not around anymore. We're talking, we're talking about 70 years. So basically all the people that we have, and we have some, I think, wonderful uh, interviewees, were either kids or teenagers. So it's kind of, so it's, it's, it's a different perspective. So we had to find many documents, letters, um, memoirs, uh, to figure out people who were kind of in their 40s and 50s and 60s at the time. So it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky subject to pull it together. But uh, since we're doing, we're making films, I mean, films have to tell a story. And I believe that it, it's a great, it's a very, it's a great story. And it's a very dramatic story. So it's, it, it's, yeah, how do you make, by, by the way, for the audience to know, Originally, this was a four-part, a four-episode series on Israeli television. Four, five, four 50 minute episodes. Out of that, we cut a 90-minute film, which is what you all saw. Yeah, without a doubt, you can you, you mentioned the drama of the events and what we see in the documentary. And I'd like to ask. Well, you're, you're coming together, Dina, who comes from perspective, who's the director, who comes from perspective of someone who went through the experience in the Bavarot. Um, and you mentioned maybe, you know, I, I don't want to say specifically for her, but this being a traumatic uh, uh, piece of history for a lot of people in Israel. And for you, for coming from a different background, how did you decide of the specific narrative you brought into the film that is, uh, as I I don't want to say objective as it could be, because obviously it is not objective, uh, but coming and deciding on the line that in which you show things um, and, and tilt them or not towards a certain direction. Look, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, when you, again, when you deal with a historical documentary, there are a few ways of doing it. One way is to, is you come with a specific agenda, good or bad, whatever, and you kind of, you bring forth that agenda and then you start telling the story around it. Um, this is not my way. What I try and do, and lucky for me and for us, we all actually, we, I have to mention Shai Lahav, who is also, who is the scriptwriter. All four of us came from a different way of thinking in which we want to bring the story. You guys, not you specifically, but you, the audience, come up with your perspective, with your notions, with your answers, with your questions. We're not going to tell you what to think. The big fights that we had were with our broadcaster, which when we started wanted something much more fierce, you know, much more direct. And we told them, guys, this is not, this is not the way we make films. And we were right at the end because the fact that we that we showed, and I think this is one of our, the successes of our, the series, at least for an Israeli audience, we show it from all perspective. I mean, we show it not from a very specific, narrow point of view, but from as much as we can, broader point of view, again, without diminishing criticism, judgment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to find the thin line between showing the big picture and showing the complex picture, but yet leaving enough room for uh, criticism and judgment and understanding is tricky. And we had a lot of fights. 
and we spent a lot of time in the editing room and we had a lot of arguments but uh, you know arguments are good they they kind of eventually they they bring out the, the kind of the the right way so you're mentioning criticism which obviously exists in uh, in the documentary uh, yet not being uh, radical like maybe the um, uh, the broadcast company wanted you to be uh, do you understand it correctly well it's not it's not so much that they wanted to be radical they, they had this notion that if we would be radical and we would create a lot of noise then they would get a big audience it's, it's television you know it's a television world this is not an academic book you know a book a, a PhD book written about the subject 10,000 people will read we're talking about a million people watching this. It's a different, a uh, million people is a lot. It's in Israel, a million people is a lot. You know that. Um, so uh, the idea was let's make a big, no I mean, let's make, you know, a big fuss about it. And we said no, and we were right because it drew a very big audience and it drew a lot of controversy, a good controversy, and a lot of questions. And the, the thing that we were happy about is that really, in many ways, everybody saw themselves in this documentary. Maybe not as much as they wanted to. Maybe some, some people thought that we were making things too pretty or too ugly, etc. But still, it, it was we tried not to bring a narrow point of view, but a much broader point of view. Um. Yes, that the trying to be to, to show the broader point of view is, is a part of history, I guess, and being a historian in what you do, right? It's a, it's a crucial matter, which is also a part of how you bring it to relevancy uh, for yeah, the Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a matter, look, they're different, you know, it's a matter of, I don't, I don't know, it's a matter of how you work. I mean, this is my way. I mean, other people work differently. Other people make filmmakers you know, kind of narrow in on a specific agenda they want to bring forth, and then they make sure this agenda will be, you know, will come through. I don't like that way. It's, it's fine. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, it's just not my way. Well, we, we have different questions from the audience right now uh, that I'd like to refer to. Uh, a lot of them have to do with the um, relationship between Ashkenazi Jews who arrived and those Mizrahi Jews from Muslim countries, uh, the different treatment. Um, you mentioned it before a little bit. You and I discussed before the the meaning of of speaking a certain language when you arrived to Israel. Um, what did it look like? And uh, later on, we'll also discuss what it looks like today. But first of all, what did it look like back then? Um, and the meaning of it, in the historical meaning of it. Look, language, when you come to a new country, language is always a huge issue. You know, I've been just reading um, a review on a book which came out not long ago about the, 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 the Jewish women's strike in 1902 about the kosher meat in the Lower East Side, which is a phenomenal story which was, which they actually succeeded, which was in Yiddish. Um, and they could speak Yiddish and they could get along with Yiddish because that's what everybody else talked to. I mean, you don't talk to the Irish and you don't talk to the Italian, but among your community, if you spoke Yiddish, you're fine. If you come to Israel and you speak Yiddish or Polish, you're fine with a very specific group who is probably good for you, the people who make decisions, not necessarily the government decisions, but the people who give out work, the people who give out food, the people who give out, you know, the day-to-day the, the -day decisions, which are, as we know, the most important decisions. But when you come and your original language is Arabic, first of all, nobody understands you. And secondly, which is the issue which continued many, 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 many years. In many ways till this day, Arabic is not a nice language. Arabic is the language of the enemy. The fact that Jews lived in Arab and Islam countries for 
generations and generations and generations in many ways in much better terms than Jews lived in Catholic or Protestant Europe, that's a different issue. But if you spoke Arabic, you have a problem. And this is, you know, it's just, just one item. And your children, I mean, many, you know, it's a kind of a thing. I mean, many children learned how to speak Hebrew, including me, by the way, although I come, my parents came from Chicago. They didn't come from Baghdad. But still, I, I, I grew up in English. I learned Hebrew in kindergarten. People came from Morocco or from Iraq or from Yemen or from Romania also learned Hebrew in kindergarten. People didn't know Hebrew at home. It's not a common language. So, but if you are, if you know Yiddish at that time or Polish or you know, German not, but mostly Yiddish, you can get along. And this is a very big issue. The second issue is that I mentioned before that in 1952, up to around 1951, for about the first two years, the number of Jews from Europe, Ashkenazi, what's called today Ashkenazi Jews, they weren't called Ashkenazi Jews at the time, but European Jews or Islam country Jews were more or less 50-50. This changed very radically in 1952 with the reparation agreements from Germany where a lot of the people, a huge portion of the people, of the Jews coming in from the European countries, from Germany, from Poland, from Hungary, got, you know, got some money, could buy an apartment, could open a small business, kind of the Israeli, you know, middle class, basically, start with their operations. And the people from the Islam countries stayed in the camps some for many, many, many years. And that's really where the rifts and where the dividing line starts around 90, not from the very beginning, because in the very beginning, everybody was mixed up with everybody and nobody knew really what was going on and, and et cetera. But when the European, the Ashkenazi leave and start a new life, and mostly the Mizrahi stay on in the Ma'abarot for one year, two years, 10 years. That's where the, the frustration starts building up. That's where the anger starts building up, which we feel till this day. So I think, I think in the film itself, there's a reference to that and saying, you know, it was easier, like you said, because of the language, knowing the people who could get you the job. Uh, also, smaller families for European uh, smaller families immigrants. is a very big issue. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there were a few questions. One of them was: once those European Jews left the camps, and Mizrahi Jews were left in the camps, and also with those who were in in Israel even before the camps, was there any connection between them and the Jews who were in the transit uh, transition camps uh, in terms of organizational support? Any some some sort of community that came into the camps to help them um, to even have some kind kind of relationship with them. Yeah, there was some. M most of the relationships were uh, family connections. If you had family in Israel before 1948, you were better off. Obviously, people who were already here since mm -hmm. the 20s, since the 30s, early 40s then things are better, which again is much more the case for European, uh, you know, Polish, Romanian, Hungarian, German Jews, obviously, because the population in Israel before wasn't from the Islam, I mean, the major population wasn't, uh, you know, North African or Islam country Jews. But uh, yes, and there, there was definitely, there was, you know, there was support, there was, uh, how would you say, um, Volunteering. Volunteering. Um, I wouldn't say it's a major uh, uh, phenomenon. It, it was, definitely. Teachers l teaching Hebrew. There were funny, there were some funny issues. There were, you know, there was this, there's a nice thing. I mean, you know, you should make fun of it. But the, you know, young girls, young girls, I mean, 18, 19, 20, who go to the army, and they were supposed to come and teach 
women from you know Islam countries how to cook. Now these women from the Islam countries they grew up with ten brothers and sisters. They were raising ten kids. They knew how to cook much better than these nice little girls from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem who basically knew how to make an omelet, maybe. So intentions were, the, uh, but again, intentions were good, but we have many stories of, you know, these women coming to these young soldiers and saying, you know, sit down, I'll teach you how to cook, it's okay. So then you, you're touching on that. I think it's a resocialization of certain people in different ways. And one of the questions has to do with something that was touched upon a little bit in the documentary was sort of secularization of uh, the Mizrahi Jews. Uh, the what? Uh, the uh, creation of, of uh, a, a new Jewish uh, uh, way of life for them. And the question was, did they, how did they preserve their own traditions and practices? Uh, was it maybe underground, because what we hear is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Israel was a uh, uh, very much ruled in a way by European Jews, their practices, their language, their cooking, and coming and changing, changing names of people and changing the ways of life. What did it look like in terms of the Jewish life, their practices uh, and traditions? Look, this is a huge question. I mean, we can spend the next two days talking about it. Um, you can change, I, I don't think, I don't think you can, the idea of a melting pot has kind of gone down the drain in most countries in the world, uh, including your country, or not yours, but the audience, my country actually, I was born in America, so I can, um, melting pots don't work. Melting pots work maybe if you live in very certain times in some in, in Soviet communist countries and you have Stalin to tell you what to do. It doesn't work. You can't change people. You can't tell somebody who's grown up for three, four, five, six, ten generations with a certain kind of music that now you have to listen to another kind of music. It doesn't work. Or change your food or change the way you pray. There was a huge issue of synagogues. And one of the nice thing is in the first year of the Ma'abarot, the synagogues were mixed. So one week they would pray in Ashkenaz tune, another pray they would pray, they would, they would pray by Yemenite, and people learn from one another. The first year in the Ma'abarot was, I wouldn't say it was paradise, but in terms of the relationships between the people, it was pretty amazing. I mean, people suddenly you have Jews from Turkey, from Yemen, from Romania, from Morocco, from Iraq, who, who learned from one another, who wanted to learn from one another. Things started to change actually, which is not very surprising, when the establishment, when the government starts messing around and say, you guys have to go there and you guys have to do this. And when you try to control a huge amount of people and, you know, for Israel, eventually 700, 800, 1 million in new immigrant, when you start trying to control and make them into what was supposedly called the new Jew, right? I'm sure you people have heard this, this idiom, the new Jew, then people say, you know, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to become a new Jew. I'm fine with the way my parents have been Jews and taught me how to be a Jew for the last 500 years, guys, you know, just relax. And when that starts getting, you know, tenser and tenser and more dramatic, then things start to explode. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's the, the famous joke about, uh, you know, having a, a Jewish person having two synagogues, the one that he goes to and the one that will never step in. Which is exactly. Uh, exactly what has happened. I'm going to touch upon and thank you everyone for the wonderful questions. And I have to say, I, you, I don't know if you can see the questions, that, but you have no. phrases about uh, the film. Don't worry about it. You have phrases and, and thank you for the documentary. There are a few technical questions and others. One was, when were the people on the film interviewed um, for the film? 
What year was that around? Well, uh, let's see. We're, we're 2020. We, I think we finished. I think we finished the, the series in 2019. So I guess they were interviewed 2017, 18. The last quite quarter. recently. Quite, quite recently. recently. Absolutely quite recently. There was another question if, if the full series, you mentioned the, the different episodes, the 50 minutes episode, is this available anywhere in the States, on any platform in the States? Probably not. It's a, if you come to Israel, you can watch it. It's for free on the uh, the tag, the Khan, the, the public broadcaster. But I think there are what's, I don't know if you know the sub, they're geo-blocked. And I don't think you can watch them. I'm afraid. Plus, they're not in. I mean, they're they. It's just in Hebrew. We don't have um, subtitles. English subtitles for them. Oh, this could be the next next project to complete that with the subtitles. I guess. Exactly. Great. Um, so we we touched upon it a little bit. We have about ten minutes left, and and a few of the questions have to do with it. And we also said we would refer to it. We're talking about 1948 until early 1950s and from there on what are the repercussions in Israeli society with Mizrahi Jews Ashkenazi Jews and you said 1952 created that rip in between the two populations how did that you know affect Israeli society and his Israel's history from then until now <coughs> excuse me um, Bless you. Well, 1952 reparations come in, et cetera, et cetera. What happened, the sad thing that happened, <clears throat> took some more, that happened with the Ma'abarot after 1950, 52, 53, 54, is that many of the Ma'abarot became slums, became poverty. I mean, they never recuperated. I mean, many people say that it was better off when we when we had the Ma'abal, at least we could have some, you know, we could grow something. But when they built very cheap housing shikunim, uh, housing, how would you say that? Housing projects. Housing projects. Like many projects that we know from in the States in many cities, you try and build these huge projects. Usually, as the case was in Israel, they become infested with poverty and crime and prostitution and violence and family violence and drugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not pleasant. Plus the fact that there was a very, very, very big um, aflaya. Help me here. Discrimination. Discrimination in terms of education. If you were like me, if you were a good Ashkenazi European kid, you went to a very good school, you could do anything. You could go to university, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you live in far away little town, in Ofakim, in Netivot, which is in the south, or you live up north, you live in places which are what usually we call later Ayarot Pituach, which is development towns, your possibilities of education were minute. And you could probably, and you were kind of um, pushed in many ways into becoming a carpenter or a welder or a builder, working with your hands not working with your head and this not also goes to the the educational system in israel those days with a with a segregation between the professional schools very big and this started in the early 1950s and went on into the 60s and this affects what hap what happens today because generations over generations over generations of young people grew up had no chance of going to the university if they even finished high school. M many of them didn't finish high school. So the, some, a lot of people, I mean, if you go into Israeli jails today, the percentage between Mizrahi 
Jews, you were talking about third, fourth generation, and Ashkenazi Jews is one to eight. So and this, as far as I'm concerned, this all starts from the starting point that you give a kid when he's growing up and is educated. That's, I mean, if there's anything to learn from history is that, you know, as they say in the song, teach your children well. I mean, that's where it all begins. And if you, if you, if you discriminate education, you'll live with this discrimination for the rest of the kids and grown up life. That's now, my idea. I, I could not, as an educator, I could not agree more. Um, I do have to say, you mentioned, you know, if you are an Ashkenazi Jew from one city or you're a Mizrahi Jew from a small developing town, then you have the gaps. But it's all, not only that, because all of this also led to the establishment of the Black Panthers in Israel, the Mizrahi yeah. Black Panthers in the 70s, yeah. the who Black actually Panthers. started in Musrara in Jerusalem, yeah. which was a Ma'abara, right? That borders yeah. with Rechavia, which is, had the elite of Jerusalem. Well, so it's Musara very intertwined. Musrara borders, they had two borders. It borders with Rechavia, which is a very upper scale uh, bourgeois university professor neighborhood. And it borders with Jordan before 1967, uh, which was the border of Israel at the time when Jerusalem was still two cities. Uh, and Musrara was a, was a, was a, as you say, Musrara was a Ma'abara, a very big Ma'abara, and it didn't change. It changed, you know, it changed physically, but internally it didn't change. The same idea, the same people, not going to school, not going to good schools, etc. So that that's really, if, if you talk about how things developed and developed over the time, um, this, this, uh, what happened, you know, the, the kind of the, the evolvement of, of the Ma'abarot, which became these slums or these very poor neighborhoods with no education or with very, you know, minute education is, is, is again, I don't know if it lives still today, but it's definitely true through the 20th century and maybe today, the third generation is kind of fighting back and it's different. But um, up to the late 20th century, this is definitely the case. Well, we can talk for hours and hours also about representation of Mizrahi Jews in Israeli culture and in, in cinema and television, Israeli music and others, and the, the separations, the politics and everything. Um, I, there are a few questions here on uh, from the crowds, but also for me, what has Israel learned from all of that? Uh, would, would they have done di things differently uh, if they could have rewritten history? Um, and, and the last question that I will tie into that with politics, someone asked, when do you think there will be a Mizrahi prime minister? So we have two questions here. What has Israel learned and where are we going towards? Let's, 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 the second one is difficult. Let's start with the first one. Um, what do we learn? We learn, I think, that you can't change people. Don't try and re-educate people. And that's true for, you know, colonialism anywhere. You know, the Portuguese and the Spanish came to South America and they tried to make everybody Christian. I mean, you, you can't, it doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. Colonialism, is doesn't work and and in many ways what happened is not colonialism because we were in the same country but in terms of the idea of the european white uh, uh supremacy not supremacy in the terms that you have in the states but um is 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 very much relevant to what the the europeans new immigrants thought about uh, the the Mizrahi and the and the people coming from the Islam countries. They're not as good as us. But but we do see, and if I may interrupt, we do see, we, we've seen a lot of waves of aliyot to Israel. The 90s, 70s, 80s, 90s, Ethiopian Jews, Russian Jews, and, and we have a lot of 
inside jokes in Israel about, you know, each generation of Olim is treating the next generation the same way of uh, sort of condescending. Uh, and it still exists uh, mm-hmm. to this day in a way. So do you think that Israel has learned, really learned how to deal with the new immigrants? I and- don't think so. No, not really. I mean, with the Ethiopian Jews, definitely not. And it's a sad, it's a small aliyah. I mean, we're not talking. With the Russian Jews, it's a different picture. We're talking about almost a million and a half people. I mean, they took over Israel in many ways. And it's so, it, it, it's a different, it's a different kind of perspective. But no, I don't, I, again, I, you know, maybe my old age, I don't think countries don't learn that much. Definitely not that fast. I mean, you know, we're not going to talk about the states, but I mean, how much self-criticism do people do in America these days? I would say, from what I hear, and I get up every morning and listen to the daily on my Spotify, um, people don't change that much. I don't think people learn that much. I mean, you know, I don't know what kind of audience we have here, but I would love to know who are the 70 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump. And you can't just, you know, that brings us to the second question of when are we going to have a Mizrahi prime minister? Trump was a Mizrahi president, by the way. In terms of Israeli politics, this is maybe a little bit complicated to grasp, but for Israeli citizens, Israeli uh, uh, politics, Donald Trump is a Mizrahi prime minister. He represents us. He represents, rightly or wrongly, he represents the uh, underprivileged, um, going against the Rechavia, the Jerusalem, the Tel Aviv, East Coast, Ivy League, etc., etc., etc. It's the same story. So when are we going to have a, 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 a? I don't think it's important when we have a, 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 a Mizrahi prime minister. I mean, Begin more Polish than Begin you can't be is considered to this day the most Mizrahi, uh, and many are uh, also. I mean, correctly in terms of what he did, uh, he is considered the Mizrahi prime minister. But I, I, th- I think, again, changes happen and will happen. Um, and they happen all the time when people are, you know, mixed families. I mean, that's where things change. Life is stronger than politics, I think, eventually. You, you mentioned mixed families. Absolutely. We had a question about if we have more mixed marriages of Ashkenazi and Mizrahi. The answer is absolutely yes. In Israel, it's, Israel, it's, it's not even an issue. It's not even an issue. Exactly. It's not that. And and we're going to digress from, from politics and everything. But I, I do have to agree, you know, that, like you said, with Menachem Begin, 1977, becoming the prime minister and creating a shift in the perception of Mizrahi Jews in, in you know, pop culture, but also in everyday life and representation uh, in Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a lot of questions, and I'm so sorry, everyone, that we couldn't get to all of your wonderful questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, everyone who was with us. And Arik, thank you so much for shedding a lot of light of this issue of the Ma'abarot and Israeli's history with that, and for sharing your creation with us in such a wonderful way. Um, thank you. Thank you for listening. I Too bad I can't see you. Maybe next year. Hopefully next next time we'll, uh, we'll be able to... Uh, <laughs> We'll be able to be together to physically. Be in, a, in, in a real cinema. In a real cinema, sitting together face to face, shaking hands. I love that. Uh, thank you very much. Happy Hanukkah to you thank and to you. everyone else. Uh, please continue following the J by J programs and uh, films, talkbacks, and conversations. It was a pleasure being with you uh, today. And once again, happy Hanukkah and a wonderful day, everyone.